Okay, so we're going to talk about system calls. This is a big deal for the uh, fourth project, and I wanted to actually show you how Linux implements system calls because you probably want to emulate it in your own implementation. It's, it's a pretty clever thing, uh, actually relying on an understanding of CDECL. So again, CDECL, if you understand it, is a big boon, and if you don't understand it, then you're probably going to do things in complicated and unnecessary complicated ways, actually. So um, user applications have to talk to the kernel through system calls, because remember, they're not allowed to do it directly. That's not entirely true anymore, because um, uh, you may or may not remember this from CS24, but there's uh, right around Pentium 4 time, I think it was, uh, people suddenly noticed that system calls were really slow. And it's because of all the things that happen. You have a privilege check. Are you allowed to enter into the kernel? And because uh, all of our gates actually can say, this is the minimum required protection level on the caller. This is the protection level when you enter wherever you're going to. And so all these checks occur, and if you're changing privilege level, then you have to change stacks as well. And so it's a general purpose mechanism, very powerful, but what they noticed around Pentium 4 time is that system calls got really slow. And they actually, you know, got to the point where it was really imposing a lot of uh, performance impact when you have functions that call into the kernel a lot. And so they created a couple of new mechanisms, sysenter, sysleave, and syscall, sysret. And what you do is you base it's like a fast path. It's kind of like a carpool lane for getting into the kernel. So you kind of expect that you're going to be starting off in ring three, and you're transitioning into ring zero, and you set up the stack, and it's basically just a fast path. If you're calling the appropriate target, then it just gets shunted right through by the processor, and it greatly improves the, the speed of system calls. And so, um, you know, I say that we typically do this with a trap instruction, but now, the way that Linux works and various other things, I should actually mention a little bit about this, is that when Linux is booting up, you know, you've got like a syscall API, and then you have various other APIs as well that are provided by the C standard library, which we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. But um, when the system is booting up, it will actually probe the processor using the CPU ID instruction to see, you know, do you support this thing? Do you support that thing? Do you support the other thing? And if it supports sysenter, it'll actually patch the system call code to use sysenter instead of using int80 because it's faster. And if it supports syscall, then it'll patch the uh, system call code in the library with the, uh, you know, the syscall operation instead of using in 80. So it actually, the, the kernel will update the standard library to make sure that the most optimal mechanism is used, which is pretty clever. And uh, so we're going to talk about the trap instruction because that's the general purpose way of doing it. But just keep in the back of your mind that there's this other way of getting into the kernel that's more specialized and more streamlined. And, uh, I'll, you know, that's probably the one that's used by 99% of system calls by now. So eventually I'll need to update this stuff. That reminds me, I have another thing I want to talk about. Um, so maybe at the end of the lecture, if we have some extra time, I'll, I'll uh, bring up this other topic. So yeah, the kernel registers a handler for a specific trap. This is always going to be there, even if you know you have your fast path stuff, because you know you have programs that are compiled on a different platform, and you want to make sure that you still support the general mechanism as well. So in 80 for Linux system calls, obviously those are hexadecimal values, so that's going to be 128. Uh, 2e for Windows and 30 for Pintos. So if you go through Pintos and you see that you have an int 30 handler, that's what that is for. In fact, that's what you'll see. Okay. Now, of course, uh, there's not an easy way of passing arguments to system calls because you switch stacks. And uh, there is actually a mechanism on IA32 for looking up stuff off the user stack. I mean, the user stack location is stored on the kernel stack, so you could just follow it and look at it. But... Um, Nobody really does that. So typically we pass things in registers. And because you pass things in registers, you have a limited number of arguments. One of the arguments has to be which system call do you want to invoke. And the return value also goes back into EAX, which is actually very similar to um, CDECL, so that's perfectly fine. So Linux and Windows use EAX to uh, specify the operation. Um, there's a number of values you can use in syscall.h, which specify the numbers, and of course, they're not always the same. 
from platform to platform. You're allowed to pick whatever you want um, because you expect people will use the APIs, the C standard API or the Unix standard API, not the actual system call numbers. Okay. So yeah, there's a few constraints. One is that the system call arguments can't be wider than the registers. Typically, this isn't an issue. Okay. If you have things that are wider, you can just pass a pointer to it, which is how most of these things work. And uh, you also have another interesting thing, that if you need more arguments than you have registers, then uh, you, know, you can do various things, like create a separate structure to hold some values, and then you pass a pointer to the structure. So you can see large arguments split across multiple registers. Just point to them. That's another option. I have to mention that uh, Unix has a very simple API in general. And so most of the time, you either have values that fit within a single register, or you just pass a pointer to a struct. Windows is very different in, in uh, and again, not many of you have done Windows programming, but uh, a lot of times the system calls take data structures and the, and the first value in the data structure is the size of the data structure. That's how they tell which version of the data structure you're using. So Windows sort of picks a very different approach from Unix in passing arguments into the kernel. So you can, you can imagine that uh, Windows system call mechanism is a little bit different because of that. Okay, so the OS uh, exposes system calls via a standard library, which is good. Okay, one of the reasons why we don't want to, you know, create our own hand-rolled mechanism that does int 80s or, you know, syscall or whatever, is that if I call the standard API, then I can move to a new platform and compile my code against that platform standard libraries and it'll just work. And so this is the whole idea of source code portability. And so um, this is why you can create a program that'll run on the Mac, it'll run on Unix, and you just compile it for the different platforms. Even if the system call numbers are different, it'll just work. Okay, so uh, that's all perfectly fine. And yeah, this library that I mentioned here is sort of a bit of a um, veneer, if you will, between the kernel and the user application. So we just have some kind of indirect mechanism so that we can write our code and we can compile it on different platforms. And the library takes care of mapping that into the kernel. Okay? So this is why we like to do this. There's very few times when you do this directly and uh, probably one of the few is in CS24 so that you can see how it works. Okay, so you have some functions that directly wrap system calls. So read and write are great examples. Close is a great example. Probably dupe and dupe2 are, are more great examples. Uh, but you can see we take three arguments. All of them are the size of a register, so we're perfectly happy there. And uh, this read implementation will call directly into the kernel because it can't really do anything by itself outside of the kernel. So um, that's also true for write and close and a few others. Other ones are more interesting because they will call into the kernel when they need to, but they won't necessarily do it unless they really have to. So malloc is a great example. I've got this data region in my address space for the heap, and as long as I have space to satisfy an allocation request, then I just do it by myself. But at some point, I may run out of space, and so there were um, on Unix systems, uh, on Linux, in particular, although now we do it a different way, break BRK and SBRK, which basically says where is the memory break point for the end of this data segment. And so I can move it out if I need more space for the heap, and now the kernel will say, okay, I'm giving them more space for their memory heap. So malloc would call that if it's unable to satisfy a request. And of course, if it calls SBreak and the kernel comes back and says, no, you have enough data heap, then malloc would return null to say, I can't allocate more space. You need to free some space before you do anything else. Okay, so um, that's an example of a, an API that actually uses system calls to implement things it can't do, but it only uses them when it has to. Okay, any questions on this? All right, it's pretty straightforward. Um, now, we already talked about the interrupt and trap handling for IA32. That was in lecture nine. So um, now we're actually in... You know, we're talking about user processes, so we have our own user stack for running our user program. We have stuff, whatever is on there. And remember, um, we talked a little bit about this stuff, not so much in this class. I guess we talked about it more toward the end of CS24, but at the very top of the stack will be like our environment and then the arguments to main, and then we invoke main and we start 
running and we have various stack frames for user uh, functions that we're calling as we run. So at some point we want to trap into the kernel because we want to read some data or we want to printf or fprintf or something like that and we trap into the kernel and there's a series of things that happen. The first thing that happens is that the pointer to the user stack, since we're switching stacks, we store a pointer to the user stack onto the kernel thread stack. Okay? And one little detail about this is that the stack segment selector value will actually indicate that we're changing protection level. So the value, you can look at the value and tell whether or not you need to change stack. So that's one of the nice things about it. Um, the kernel has various ways of doing this to make sure that uh, everything works properly. Okay, so that's stored. Then we store the execution state. I'm sorry, I think I misspoke. I think it's the EIP that actually stores that stuff, or the CS. So one of those values says we're switching protection levels, and so that is how the processor knows whether or not there's a stack pointer that it needs to pull off of the current stack. Okay, so we store CS, EIP, and E flags, and now we're in the trap handler. Okay, and so just to continue our discussion, remember that uh, some interrupts, Specifically, faults will store an error code indicating what happens. Um, most of the faults store with a specific format, but the page fault is special because it wants to say, was it an instruction or was it data that caused the fault? Is it writing to read-only memory? Is it trying to execute something that's not in an execute segment? That kind of detail will be in the error code. Uh, and just to make everything consistent, Operating systems typically will push a dummy value if it's an interrupt or a trap that doesn't have an error code. So from the perspective of our trap handling, we'll have a dummy error code. We don't even look at it. We don't care. It's just going to be some value picked by the operating system. Then we have the interrupt number pushed onto the stack so that we can have multiple handlers for very... I'm sorry, I misstated that. We'll, um, we'll have, we can have one handler for many different interrupts. And so remember that uh, like IE32 supports 256 different interrupts. Most of them we don't care about. Many of them we just don't even handle. And so the operating system will install a simple handler that those interrupts will invoke if those uh, interrupts are triggered so that we can just say, hey, we got this weird interrupt. We don't know what it is. We'll just ignore it and go on. So that's why the interrupt number is also pushed onto the stack. Then the... Register state is stored onto the kernel stack, so that was the user process stacks, or I'm sorry, the user programs uh, registers, and now we can do whatever we want without worrying about disrupting the user program. Okay, so that's this was all the stuff we talked about in lecture nine of just these various things. Now let's start looking at the system call details. Okay, so the operating system is exposing the CPU and register state to the interrupt service routine. That's what ISR stands for, interrupt service routine. And so the ISR will typically have some struct as its argument, which has all these values that were pushed by the, um, you know, the sort of the ISR wrapper that calls into the C implementation. And so the system call handler needs to be able to see the arguments, and those were stored in the register. So it can just access those on the stack now. That's easy enough. Also, it has to be able to return a status result in EAX, but not its EAX. So all it needs to do is just modify the interrupted program's register state. And when we IRET at the end of the trap handler, it'll see its EAX has been changed because that uh, program context will be restored into the registers, and it'll say, oh, okay, EAX has now been changed to store the status value of the uh, system call. Okay. So that's easy enough. Any questions about this? This is one of those things that's kind of fun, is that since we're in the kernel and the user program is actually, its machine context is stored on the stack and we can get a pointer to it or we can modify it directly, we can actually change things so that the user program sees those changes when we return back to it. So that's one of the really neat things about this mechanism. Okay, let's see. The specific routine that handles a system call is called a system call service routine. That's not very surprising. But uh, basically, we'll have one of these service routines for each system call that we support. And typically, we name them in a way that makes it really clear that it's the system call service routine for a particular syscall. So uh, syswrite for write, sysfork for fork, 
sys read for read, sys close for close, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, that makes it really easy. And that's one of the things you'll notice this week, or I should say for the next two weeks, is that you'll have a file full of these little sys underscore blah things for the various system calls you have to implement. Now, what if you have one system call and it needs to call another system call? Well, you definitely don't want to trap into the kernel. That's dumb. That's way too much overhead for invoking the other operation. So you just call sys underscore whatever to go ahead and perform the operation. So that's kind of a nice thing if you need to build up some system call and uh, you need to use various other operations. How are these things dispatched? Well, the same way that a lot of things are dispatched in both the CPU and in the kernel, we have an array, and the array is full of function pointers. The array will be the size of the number of system calls we allow, and each entry in that array will simply be the, the pointer, the function pointer to the system call service routine. Okay? And so what we do in the system call handler is we just use a system call number to index into that uh, array, and then we just call the appropriate service routine to handle the operation. It's a really simple mechanism. <clears throat> of course, we also need to make sure that it is a valid system call. Um, again, you'll, you'll notice some of these things if you look at the Linux system call implementation, which we'll take a very brief look through. Um, but you will have some system calls, I should say some numbers, that don't correspond to a, a valid system call. So you just put it in a special hook to a, a system call handler or system call service routine that says, I'm not a system call, and that's all it does. So it just sets EAX to uh, enosys, and then the user program will see, oh, okay, I tried to call something that wasn't valid. Okay? So that's how you handle gaps within the system call numbers. Okay? So one of the things you do is check that it's below the max system call ID, and uh, that was the other thing. I'm not a system call, system call handler. So here's the way that the Linux system call handler works. This is basically the interrupt service routine. There's a lot of other stuff I'm leaving out because, remember, system calls are a great point to perform context switches. So if we're doing something that's slow, we probably want to do a context switch. Um, there's a few other things that are saved and restored and handled as well, so we're kind of ignoring all of that stuff. But the save registers onto stack is going to save the, the user process context. Okay. But it'll still be in the register, so when we look at EAX, it's still whatever the user process passed in. So we just basically look at it and say, is it above or equal to the number of system calls? If it is, then we need to go ahead and tell the user program, hey, this is really bad. Notice how we access it. We say minus enosys, and then we say 24 ESP. Well, that happens to be the position of EAX on the kernel stack. I should say the user processes value for EAX on the kernel stack. Okay? So that's kind of gross. You kind of wish that they would do this in some better way, but that's how the uh, kernel's written. Uh, those wily kernel programmers. And then you return from the system call so that they see that uh, they tried to call something that's invalid. Otherwise, you jump down to no bad sys, and you actually dispatch to the system call service routine. Okay? So we have syscall table, that is the start of the array of system call function pointers. And uh, remember that pointers are four bytes on IE32, we're just still in 32-bit land. And so we use EAX to index into that, we just multiply it by four to um, call the appropriate function in the system call uh, table. Okay. Now, that'll run, and then it returns, and it follows cdecl, so the return value is in EAX, and so we just squirrel that away into the appropriate location on the kernel stack for overriding the user processes, uh, you know, machine context, and then we return. Okay? And like I said, uh, ret from syscall will do things like saying, hey, do I need to do a scheduled process switch? If I do, then go ahead and do that. Otherwise, if we go right back to the kernel, then, I mean, right back to the, right back to the user program, which we will eventually, then the user processes context will be restored off the kernel stack. They'll see the change to EAX, and they'll know whether or not their system call succeeded. Okay, any questions? Pretty straightforward. Now, there's an interesting thing. This system call table is full of C functions, right? They're all function pointers to C functions, and so we need to somehow figure out how to pass our arguments 
to those C functions. We know that the return value is coming back in EAX, so that part is perfectly fine. Um, what, but we basically get to follow C decal, and we can leverage C decal to make this really simple. So we have some system calls that require no arguments. Okay. That's a bit of a misnomer that fork doesn't require any arguments. Fork actually needs to know all of the processes registers so that when it sets up a new process, the initial register context will be the same register values as the old one. Uh, MMAP requires up to six arguments to specify the memory mapping change that you want to perform. And, of course, these things are passed in specific registers. And the way that we do this is EAX is the system call number, like we said before. EBX will be the first argument. ECX will be the second argument. EDX will be the third argument. ESI, EDI, EBP. Okay, so we have up to six arguments we can pass. And these service routines are written in C. So they do expect their arguments to be on the kernel stack. <clears throat> And so what the system call handler does is it always pushes all the registers in a specific order. And it pushes them in the reverse order that the arguments are used to pass the, uh, the, func the arguments to the system call handlers. Now you may already be thinking C decal, and that's exactly what you should be thinking. So the last argument is pushed first, then the next to last, and all the way up to the first argument, EBX. Okay, so they're pushed in that order. And now that we have this set up, um, remember that under CDECL, if a function is passed more arguments than it cares about, it ignores the remaining arguments. That's one of the reasons we love CDECL. It's kind of resilient and robust this way. So if you have a function that only cares about three arguments, well, it doesn't care about the fact that arg4, arg5, and arg6 were pushed on. If we have one that takes no arguments, it doesn't care about any of them. Okay. So basically, this allows us to, to dispatch to all our various system call service routines, regardless of the number of arguments they take. If it takes six, that's great. If it takes zero, that's also great. We don't care. Okay? So syswrite is a great example because it takes three. It takes, you know, this is for write, so we take file descriptor, we take the buffer to store data into, I'm sorry, the, the buffer to pull data out of, because it's write, and the number of bytes in the buffer. And so that is handled by syswrite, and that takes three arguments. So EBX is the file descriptor, ECX is the pointer to the buffer, and EDX is the number of bytes to read out of the buffer. Okay. And so when the system call handler dispatches, remember, all of that stuff is pushed, and then it does call and looks up the address to call in the system call table. Then basically, we have a stack set up exactly like syswrite would like to see, so it can be written in, in C code. So we have the return address to jump back to when call returns, and uh, the frame for syswrite is now set up. So, you know, push EBX or EBP, move ESP into EBP, access my arguments, they're exactly where I'd expect them to be, and I can push other things if I need to and so forth. Okay, so this is a pretty clever mechanism relying on the convention that uh, we have specified of CDECL and the fact that we can actually ignore extra arguments uh, without affecting anything. Okay, any questions? You may want to do something like this to make your life easy. There's, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, really bad approaches to writing system calls because people um, you know, probably have forgotten by this point that CDECL handles this kind of thing very easily. Okay, so there's a little hint for you. Okay, the next thing to talk about <clears throat> we need to check our arguments. That goes without saying, but it turns out that there's some very naughty things that user programs can try to do, and if the operating system allows it, then you're not going to have a very good operating system. The most obvious one that you have to think about is I'm passing a pointer to the kernel, and the user process is not allowed to write to all of the address space, right? It's a user process. It's running in a restricted protection level. But the kernel is allowed to access anything, and it's allowed to manipulate anything, and it's getting a pointer from a program that may be trying to be naughty. So do I need to actually check the pointers? And the answer should be obviously yes. Let's say that we have a read operation. You could do the same kind of naughty things with write. 
Okay, I want to read data from the file specified by this file descriptor, stored into this buffer, sure, whatever pointer you want, and read this many bytes. So this is, these are the things that the caller specifies. That's pretty obvious. We're all familiar with read by now. <clears throat> you expect that the pointer is going to be in user space, but you're not required that it be. Like, I can pass whatever pointer I want, and so it's up to the kernel to make sure that the pointer that the kernel is handed is actually a pointer that is reasonable for that user process. What if the user program were to specify a pointer to something in kernel space? Okay. And without any checks, the kernel, remember, is allowed to do whatever it wants because it's running in the highest protection level. So if you passed an address in the kernel's address space, it would read data out of that file and plop it into the kernel wherever you want. That sounds great. You know, maybe you target the root uh, password, maybe you target other processes, maybe you target stuff in the kernel. And so like I say here, as long as the user mode program doesn't try to dereference that address and access whatever values are at that address, it won't generate any faults. And the kernel can try to do that. <clears throat> and if it were to just accept the address, who knows what havoc would be wreaked? Okay. Uh, I'm really curious, just as an aside, whether or not this was caught by somebody exploiting it or somebody thinking cleverly when they were designing the system. Because every time you have a situation like this, it's not necessarily that somebody exploited it before people realized that this was a problem. So it's kind of an interesting thing. But you could target uh, criti critical data structures. So I create a file with the data I want to store. And then I go ahead and pass it to the, the kernel and say, hey, kernel, write into this part of yourself. And it would just go ahead and do it. Yes? Um, so as far as virtual memory is concerned, I think we'll talk about it in a second. But remember that the kernel is mapped into the same address range for all processes. So, And that's really necessary because when you do a context switch, um, the address range that the kernel occupies is also part of the memory mapping that changes. And so the kernel needs to be at the same location in all the processes so that when it switches, it's, it's still at the same instruction and the data is all at the same location that it needs to be in. So the kernel part, at least, um, typically on 32-bit, 3 gigs and up is a, uh, yeah, I should be careful. Uh, the 3 gigabyte boundary and up is allocated to the kernel, and the bottom 3 gigs are allocated to user processes. And so, you know, every user process starts at a specific address, 804-8000, more or less. I mean, now people actually jitter it to, um, for security and uh, safety, but um, then uh, the, uh, you know, so user processes all start at that address. And it's a virtual address space, so that'll be mapped to different physical pages. So different user processes will occupy different physical page frames, but they all think that they're occupying the same address space as, as uh, is specified by the memory mapping uh, that the page table specifies. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Any other questions about that stuff? Okay, so the kernel has to be mapped at the same location. So if a user process says, oh, I know that this thing is here, then it could try to target it because it's going to be um, at that address for everyone, every process. Okay, yeah, so there you go. There's a picture of it all. <clears throat> so important constraints. At the very least, when you get a, a pointer from a user program, it must point to some address in user space. It can't point to an address in the kernel. If it does, you just say that they violated uh, you know, the memory access constraints and you send them a signal saying you must act. Now that's one thing you could do. Another thing you could do is actually uh, just say, hey, <laughs> you know, funny, funny jokester, that was a bad address. You could do something like that as well. So it's kind of up to the operating system to decide how they want to handle invalid pointers because they're checking these things uh, very carefully. Okay, so a really easy thing to do is just say, is the pointer less than C0000000? Because okay. if it's less than that, then it's in user space, and if it's that value or higher, then it's in kernel space. Okay, so that's a really easy way to check things. And that's one of the checks that you need to do in your program. Um, 
But then you still have these other interesting situations. What if you try to write to unallocated memory or read from unallocated memory? Because like I said, the data segment, and we actually have this here in the picture, you'll see that uh, 804, 8000, and then above that is BRK. That's the end of the data segment for the user program. So that's the top of the heap, and we can move that, but if it hasn't been moved yet, then if we have any accesses into that darker region, then that's access to an invalid uh, address. So we need to flag that. Okay. Or what if I try to write something that's in the program text, which is usually stored read-only. Okay. So we have these things that we need to be able to handle. And again, um, those things would probably still cause the kernel to fault because it doesn't matter if the kernel wants to do it. If the memory is marked as read-only, then the operating system will still generate a protection fault for that. So uh, the, the kernel would see that fault. And this is the thing that's really challenging about it. The fault is generated in kernel code by kernel code trying to access an address that's invalid. So we need to somehow say, okay, this fault generated by the kernel is a problem for the user process. Or <laughs> maybe it's because the kernel's got a bug in it. I know that kernels never have bugs in them, right? So, uh, you know, the kernel tries to access some address and the kernel basically seg faults. Okay, well, we need to be able to identify that it's the kernel and not the user process. Or we could have these other situations which are not errors, which I say here. Um, typically, and we haven't talked about this yet, we won't talk about it for a couple more weeks, but um, there's this whole thing called demand paging, where I don't actually allocate a page to a user process's address space until it wants to use it. So the very first access to the page always generates a fault, and that's the point where it gets allocated. Okay? So that may just mean I need to do some extra work. Or I may have a situation like copy on write, where I have a page that's shared by multiple processes and they think it's read write, but I made it read only so that when they change it, I can go ahead and duplicate it and allow other processes to, or I should say allow a process to write to its own private copy of it. Okay? So these scenarios need to be handled as well. So you can see that I have basically two signals. I have a page fault or a protection fault. And I need to be able to figure out which of these many scenarios it is. Is it one of these valid ones? Is it a bad pointer from a user process? Is, is it a bug in the kernel? I think that handles it all. So anyway, you have all these scenarios you need to deal with. Okay. Now, um, the nice thing about Pintos, and I just mentioned this um, because it will specifically be a great comfort to you at this point, there is no virtual memory yet. <laughs> I mean, virtual memory is set up, but it's basically an identity mapping. And so when you have a page fault, who cares? Program is dead. It's a bug. Okay? Um, so that's the one nice thing about that. Now, the one, um, yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true for, for this project. So project four, all page faults are bad. It means somebody did something naughty. Now, uh, when you get into Project 5 and you actually have virtual memory, then you have to be a lot more clever, but uh, you'll get there. Um, but there are all these various situations. Okay, you have memory faults generated by kernel code. That's what I mean by within the kernel. So it's generated by kernel code, uh, which can be valid scenarios. It can be an invalid pointer passed to a system call, and it can be a kernel bug. It could be any one of those three things, and we have to identify which one it is. Okay, so we'll talk about valid scenarios in a few weeks because this is not the week for virtual memory. Um, now we have to figure out the two invalid scenarios. Is it an invalid pointer or is it a kernel bug? Okay, so this is the challenge. <clears throat> Linux has a great solution to this. I think it's fantastic. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. Again, you'll see this. If you have the understanding of the Linux kernel book and you want to read the system call section, there's a whole chapter on system calls that actually goes through a lot of this stuff in much more detail than we're covering. We're basically covering it at the level that I um, felt motivated to actually create slides for, which um, is kind of a high barrier. So, um, But I thought this was kind of neat. Um, basically, the thing that Linux asks very insightful question is, how much code in the kernel actually is responsible for interacting with user space? Is it a lot? Is it a little? 
Well, one of the things that you'll notice if you read either understanding the Linux kernel or you read the Linux kernel source itself um, is that um, the Linux kernel actually has helper functions exactly like Pintos has for project four. I want to read a byte out of user space. I want to write a byte to user space. Except that Linux also has, I want to read a word, you know, the IA32 definition of a word, two bytes. I want to read a D word. I want to read a quad word. Okay? So Linux actually has operations exactly like that. So when a system call service routine wants to read some data from the user process's address space, it uses these helper functions. So how much code in the kernel actually interacts with user space? It's a surprisingly small amount. It's just these helper functions. So since it's small, let's keep track of all of those addresses of the instructions that interact with user space. And that is in this thing called an exception table. Now there's other information in it as well, which makes it too complicated to want to create slides to explain it. Um, and it's not interesting enough to explain anyway. Um, but basically, we just keep track of all the instructions. It's wild, right? Uh, all the instructions that actually touch user space. And when we have a fault generated, we can just look in our exception table. If the fault is generated by any of the instructions listed in the exception table, then the user process passed us a bad address. That's how we tell. If it's not in the exception table, then we have a bigger problem. Because <laughs> it was caused, we have a fault that was generated by the kernel. And remember, we've already identified the valid scenarios. It's not that I need to map in a page, or I, I need to map a page into a frame. It's not that somebody's doing copy on write. I had a fault. And it wasn't any of the good situations, and it wasn't the user process's fault. So whose fault is it? There's only one person left, the kernel. So crap, right? So that's the one thing that uh, you need to identify. Yeah. So in the fault handler, after you've checked if it's a valid scenario, then you look in the exception table. If it's in the exception table, then it's the user process's fault. If it's not in the exception table, then it's the kernel's fault. Okay. Again, this happens. If it's, yeah, this is great, right? Now you have a choice again. The kernel just seg faulted or did something really naughty. Um, you could bring down the entire system. But remember, the kernel is in a kernel thread, and that kernel thread or corresponds to user process. So um, what I could do is say, you know what? I did something really bad, and instead of bringing down the entire system, I'm just going to kill this process and switch to a different kernel thread. So that is called a kernel oops. Okay? <laughs> and it is kind of a big oops, because you're basically saying, yeah, I made a mistake, and this process is going to get it, because I, I did something bad. Okay? But at least the operating system stays up for however long. If it's starting to be unstable anyway, then you're really set. Now, you can imagine if you have a situation like this that occurs in an interrupt handler. If it's the right interrupt handler, then you may have a kernel panic and then the entire system goes down. Okay? But, so kernel oops is like a kernel panic junior. <laughs> you know, so it's like I can, I can uh, maybe recover, but uh, it's, it's not going to bring down the entire system. Here's a, uh, an old kernel oops from, uh, I think it's actually from SunOS or Solaris running on a Spark. Um, so you can see it's a 32-bit processor. It's a RISC processor, so that's why we have, like, tons of registers. It's like, ah, oh, what a world that would be to live in. Um, but anyway, you can see that we have, uh, you know, some humor on the part of uh, software engineers. Anyway, so that's just a simple example. Are, are there any questions about this mechanism? You do not have to do exception tables because your operating system is simple enough that if it does something naughty, it will just crash. So, uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about kernel oopses at least. But, uh, and you also, I don't think you have to do copy on write unless you really want to. I think it's one of those, uh, like, really extra credit things. And uh, so, I mean, you have a much, sim you know, much simpler mechanism to worry about. Page faults, mapping, pages into frames when it's not been uh, allocated yet, because you will have to implement demand paging. And uh, otherwise, uh, you have to tell the distinction between a user process 
passing a bad pointer or the kernel being naughty. So those are those are pretty straightforward. Okay, so if you don't have any questions, then uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw this up here just to, again, pitch what we're doing next week. So we're going to talk about two topics that real operating systems care about a lot, signal handling and kernel allocators, which is a really important topic because, like I men uh, mentioned before, um, fragmentation is a thing that kernels have to think about, and kernels run longer than any other piece of software on your computer. So... Uh, you know, the kernel allocators are designed very carefully to try to avoid that. So, um, very important thing to talk about. Okay, so that's what we'll talk about next week.